Um, a year ago, I started a project called Bergamot Monitoring. At the time, I was a monitoring consultant. Uh, so I worked for an open source consultancy called Transfer Technologies in Northampton, and we did a lot of NADJOS monitoring for people. And frankly, NADJOS drove me up the wall because it just feels old and out of date. And when you try to scale NADJOS, lots of things go very horrifically wrong. Uh, so those kind of frustrations and my you know, love of reinventing the wheel, I decided to start an open source project. <laughs> so it's called Bergamot, Mo Bergamot Monitoring, it's bergamot-monitoring.org, uh, at Bergamot Monitor on Twitter, and I'm Chris Ellis, I'm at Intrabids on Twitter. So if you want to tweet me and tell me I'm an idiot, then do so. So who in the room is, who looks after networks and infrastructures, and who does monitoring? Anybody use NADJOS? Right, see. So, a little bit about why is monitoring so important? Well, IT is you know, more and more complicated every day, and it's more and more important. A company can't afford to lose its website these days because it's massive reputation damage and cost of business. And monitoring is there to make sure your service is running all the time. It's checking it 24, 24 hours a day, so many days a week, 365 days a year, and quarter of a year. And telling somebody as soon as something's gone wrong. And the old kind of proverb, really, that a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to see it, does it make a sound? If your slave database stops, does anybody notice? That was an alert, I think. No, it's probably just there. We'll find out in a bit. <laughs> uh, so, what is the remote monitoring? Well, it's an open source distributed monitoring system. So, NADGEOS is very inherently a single process, single server, single thing. It really struggles when you want to monitor multiple sites in different geographic areas, or if you can't physically handle the number of checks you need to run on one server. There are then extensions you have to start using. Recently, this has got even more complicated because now Jobs has got three forks now and different extensions while you work against one fork, etc. So, as I said earlier, I started this project a year ago. I'm hopefully going to push it into this weekend. Uh, I've gone past my thousand to commit now. It's about 70,000, 80,000 lines of code, all in Java, and about 60,000 lines of code in other libraries I've written over the last kind of few years. And it's kind of a key thing of what I wanted the system to be is I wanted it to be as compatible with NADJOS as I could. So I wanted to be able to reuse NADJOS plugins because I need people to be able to migrate from NADJOS and I want to make that easy. So Bergamot connects to any NADJOS plugin you're currently using or anything you can find. If you happen to be using NRPE, then we can talk it natively. Why fork the process to open the TCP connection? And make things even better, I can actually import your NADGES config, convert it, and run it. And we're distributed by default. It's all designed around message queues and uh, clustering, so that there isn't a single point of failure anywhere in the system, and you can distribute stuff through geographically and load paths. We're also, by nature of being distributed in a kind of service-oriented architecture, we're kind of very modular, so everything's broken down into a specific service. So we have lots of different types of workers for to check, so NADRIOS, SNMP, HTTP, uh, customized server agent, you know, lots in the pipeline, hopefully as well. And different notifiers, we can send emails, SMS, webhooks, and hopefully have something like Slack and IT coming in. And again, we're scalable, because we can load balance across different servers, we can load balance the UI across a kind of coherent cluster. And it's really easy to add new check capacity. If you need to add, you know, monitor another site or another server, you just spin up a worker in that particular area and connect into the message queue. And again, by being distributed, we're actually also end up being quite resilient in that we can tolerate failure of the worker node, we can tolerate failure of the UI node. Um, we also aim to be as secure as possible, so we use TLS basically everywhere and certificates are used to authenticate the servers to the monitoring system and the system to the server. 
So the, one of the points of view we use NLP is it actually uses anonymous diff Helm and key exchange, if anybody knows what that means. Which means you can actually man admit that if you're in a position to pass it to somebody. We're also persistent, we store everything in a Postgres database. Um, which means you can write reports against the data if you need to, for all the history of monitoring statements and got storage space. Uh, and configuration changes made online with no downtime. If you've ever used Nagios, especially uh, scale up to Nagios, you end up with quite very good downtime windows, which if your monitoring is critical, that's not very great to do. We've also got a completely real-time user interface. The user interface uses WebSockets to update the browser as soon as something happens. And I'll demonstrate this in a bit, but we can actually have less than a couple of hundred milliseconds round-trip time for telling a change to execute and the UI updating. And it's all open source, LGPL3, uh, JSON REST API, so you can pull it out you need. And it's all scriptable, so you can actually extend the built in engines using the architecture. So, architecturally, we have multiple UI nodes, Postgres database, Rabbit MQ for messaging, workers, and notifiers. Uh, so, that was a very quick overview of some of the features we've got and how it all hangs together. So, let's actually have a look, because that's far more interesting. So does anybody have any questions? Um, the, the reason I've, well I mean it's not a fork, it's a no, complete it's fresh project. Uh, yeah, but I mean the Nagios plugin specification is you just fork a process with a particular, you know, standardized command line and it's got an exit code of one to four and it outputs OK for <laughs> so the actual you know concept of not just plugin is, is very minimal really. Um, now now just something quite interesting because um, one of the developers who wrote 94% of the code for Nagios 4, the Nagios dev team uh, exiled him essentially. Uh, so that's now a project called Name Up, which is um, got the person who's working on Nagios 4. It's basically his project and his company's project. So Nagios isn't necessarily the best community to work in either if you wanted to contribute to the call. Um, they don't seem particularly receptive. And they're just interested essentially in their own kind of commercial push of it. Um, so yeah. Like Java. So I like Java. <laughs> <laughs> essentially, I've been writing Java for a long time. Um, it's fast. Uh, it's nice, clean language. Um, I, you know, as much as C is fast, you have to do so much boilerplate to do stuff like string handling, and it wouldn't really be suitable for what I'm doing. Um, whereas Java allowed me to get my I've got to fairly quickly, essentially. Um, and I'm not really a fan of scripting languages like Python or Perl, etc. So that's where it comes from. Doesn't having the Postgres back end introduce a point of failure? Uh, yes and no. Um, you can, um, if you need to do a proper deployment, you need to replicate the Postgres database and do HA at that level. Um, but yes, ultimately, all check results are serialized in the database. So having the data still there is needed to have a uh, service up. Um, but it gets more complicated. In that, uh, you could, the data's going to be stored somewhere. Who do you use for scheme? Uh, not with the level of transactions that we're going on. On, on a medium-sized system, uh, which I mean, three hundred checks, you've got a check setting going on. Um, so you scale up, and that's literally ten servers. If you scale it up to hundred or thousands, you, you start actually with quite a lot of uh, transactions that can go into the database. Um, and that there's one particular table that on a large system will be growing very, very quickly. Um, 
And I mean, one of the problems with NADROS is it stores everything in memory, which actually, if you're doing it efficiently in memory, it's fast, obviously. NADROS isn't necessarily always efficient for lots of linear scans. Um, but also, you can't, miss it. it's very difficult to go and get that memory out, and if you stop it, you've lost everything. Um, so, actually being able to do a restart and have all the state there is, is very useful. Uh, and often, you know, a lot of the assumption with NADROS is that, oh, it's easier to store it in memory and serialize it out every minute to a text file. Actually, when you've got a few thousand checks, like 50,000 checks, that's actually a massive I.O. load just writing out a text file. Whereas database is actually quite efficient at I.O. these days. Because they have to be... <laughs> so, it, yeah. Anyway, so this is the kind of overview dashboard. So at the moment, you can see we've got one in there. Not full of hard. And then just like Nagios, we split stuff down into groups. We also introduced the concept of locations. So a location is where a host is physically located. So be it in the cloud, be it in your office or remote, etc. Um, groups can contain groups and they contain any kind of check. So you'd be at a host or a service. Whereas in Nagios it's very much more rigid. You have host groups and service groups. And unlike Nagios, we don't use groups to apply configuration. We apply configuration to inheritance only. And we inherit services down from templates. For anybody who's done Nagios before. So we can drill down into a group. This one has more groups. We finally get a host. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of kind of a fair, fairly visual person, so I've designed the UI to be very visual. I don't really like tables. I want to be able to see stuff is wrong visually, so as soon as it goes wrong, it will kind of show up red or purple or something. And it's about the real time thing. So we can then drill down into host level, and we can see all the checks on the host. Have you ever seen an icon kind of pulsing at some point? Like real time place. Also, tell that we've got to now for the service. Which will come back at the same time. Also, alert histories, comments on checks, downtime, and other features I've added in version 2 is. Uh, graphic uh, metrics. So check and publish metrics that are then stored in multiple graphs. And then another kind of statistics about how the checks are executed, etc. You can also view the transition history of the check. You can see every result and the transition towards a certain Results, uh, a bad check doesn't necessarily immediately mean an alert. You then apply kind of um, some state transition logic. So we say that if we've had four bad checks, then it's an alert. Um, which is, that's a concept in natural as well, so it's a concept of soft and hard states. Um, we've got all that as well, and we can have different thresholds for alerting and recovering. So you can have a check that can alert immediately but recover slowly, things like that. So you can kind of get a kind of history as it's there. Um, we've also got multiple intervals that you can specify for polling normal stuff if it's okay. So if it's I think it's okay, you can poll it maybe every five minutes. If it's gone wrong, you might poll it every minute to spot when it recovers. Uh, and we can also during transition poll it even faster if we wanted to alert really quickly, etc. Um, email, SMS, um, arbitrary web services. Um, Actually, writing a notify is fairly easy. Uh, for messaging, you just pick a message off the queue which says send an alert to these contacts and just do what you need. Um, so, if you wanted to send a, I don't know, think of a communication method, <laughs> then it's, it's actually, you know, like the SMS code I wrote in about 20 minutes using a, a service called Twilio. Um, 
which actually got really great onboarding process and we kind of didn't encounter. Um, and you know, I've got a message to I read I was read to Java and said, I've got a particular object I get back called a notification or in this particular case send alert to send it to me. Uh, which then has got a list of mobile phone numbers to send it to basically. And it's literally kind of twenty lines of code to just construct the text of the SMS and send it. But I mean, because it's all distributed, you don't have to write it in Java. If you want to write a worker or a notifier, you can write it in whatever language you like, as long as you pass JSON. So all the internal messaging is JSON structures. Um, so if you like JSON, uh, then you do what you like. So for every kind of type of check, we have a command line which tells us how to uh, actually implement that check. So one of the interesting things I've also got coming out in version two is I've got a HTTP engine which does non-blocking HTTP calls. And RabbitMQ has HTTP API. Java, another reason to use Java is actually got really good Java it's got really fast JavaScript engine. So it can actually execute JavaScript at the same kind of speed as the API, which is actually all then translated down to the JVM. Um, so, perfect storm really. I can make generic HTTP calls using JSON JavaScript. So I can define loads of checks with just a small block of XML. So here's a sample check or Calling the RabbitMQ API and doing a check based on, you know, is this exchange here or what's the number of messages flowing through this exchange? And literally, kind of four or five lines of JavaScript you can build up a kind of customized check for the HTTP API. Um, so, yeah, so You can also, uh, so all the configurations done in XML format, which was designed, A, it was quite quick and easy to get XML format from running, rather than writing a kind of custom parser for a custom uh, syntax. And well designed XML can actually be quite nice to work with, hopefully. So I've ended up with a format that's reasonably expressive and can be shorter usually than the equivalent of JavaScript. code. Um, we can actually make configuration changes in real time. Well, not online, so we don't have to shut them down. Can kind of literally, I would have to this now, but I can't actually see the screen. <laughs> we can make a change and apply it along with you know, a history of all the changes. So, this is the kind of topic we have for the next couple of months.
it's not necessarily quicker to apply changes, it's at the moment sort of the inherent infrastructure is being inefficient. It will go away in updated data structures. It is technical. Yeah. Stuff. Well, I'm stopping the stuff. Exactly. Um, don't don't get any copy change made in the group plan. Yeah. Um, the, the, the group level, we the group processing is quite interesting. Is we've got a hierarchy of groups, so we actually have to do a recursive query to calculate the state of a group. So, for example, we've got seven checks that are okay, none in downtime, none in threads, and none not okay. And to do that, we actually have to compute the graph of groups and checks in that, which is all done using recursive SQL on the database. Could you clarify the problem that you're trying to solve? In other words, what's the purpose of this? Sure. Is it, is it trying to address some other net need? Uh, yeah, so the biggest problem with Nadros, Nadros is really flexible, but it can't scale. So one of the key things about Bergmark is that it can scale, and it can be distributed. And it's got all the function and flexibility of Nadros at the same time. Um, and a great set of features and a better user interface, easy way to make configuration changes, etc. So why aren't Nadros doing what you're doing? Uh, no idea. Can't imagine that. Interested. They've got they've got a, I don't think they've got much vision to be honest. And they've got a, you know, they're trying to commercial it in one way, um, and they're so far down one route, you can't necessarily see What's the phrase? You can't see the wood for the trees. Um, and sometimes, you know, to, to be honest, this all came about as I, I wrote a config part of Nagios to make a configuration change across a lot of stuff easy. And then I was kind of sat in the coffee shop and had one of those bright idea moments that was a bit stupid, which was that, oh, if I compile the config, how much harder is it to actually execute the check? It's only 14 process. And then uh, 14 months later, I'm here. <laughs> So it's a bit of a now it's a wonderland of how far all that we've done to it. Um, at the moment, all the config changes are made. You can still have to kind of edit a text format, which hopefully in coming releases I'll have a nice GUI to edit the config, to make things even more smooth and seamless. Any kind of more questions? Where do people drop them? This is purely a monitoring system. So yes. I have no more for those to control the services. No. So I couldn't say we start this. Not at the moment. Um, in, in, theory, the question, in, in theory, you could write a notify to do that. I wouldn't say that's the best way to do it. That is something I've considered would be a nice idea. But it's then about uh, can that be done securely? Because obviously, allowing people to restart stuff randomly from one central place isn't necessarily a brilliant idea from a security perspective. And what is if you've got you know, somebody who's not necessarily it was new to a system, not thought things through properly, restarts all of your database services at the same time, you could end up in the right nightmare. So it would be nice to have that flexibility, but I want to spend the time to think about doing it properly. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, in theory, you could write a notifier that made a SSH call and logged in and did what it needed to do. 